say I'm actually pretty nervous because uh, this is a big audience for me. I, I'm usually in a laboratory looking through a microscope. And uh, also, I don't speak Spanish at all. And also, I, I wasn't really sure what to talk about because um, I've worked on a couple of different topics that are of interest. But um, as I was thinking about that, I, I remembered back to the first time I ever had to give a public talk like this. I was a graduate student at Harvard and I just finished my thesis research and we had to present it to the entire department. And I asked my professor, well, I have all this really interesting data, but how do I make it interesting to a more general audience? And he told me that whenever you give a talk like this, about one third of the people will be listening to you and understanding, and about one third of the people will be listening to you and not understanding, and the other third will be pretending to listen and actually having sexual fantasies. <laughs> so I thought I'll probably talk about uh, sex. And if you could show the first slide, please. Uh, I want to address a really simple question, and it's the question, what makes people gay? Uh, over history, there have been a lot of possible answers to that question. And over most of history, this is like a spiritual thing here praying to all the gods. Uh, if you could show the next slide, please. The right button. Oh, well, there we go. Thank you. All right, some of you may recognize this. It's a cathedral right in this city. And over much of history, the religious answer was that uh, people are gay because they're bad people. And we heard a little bit of that um, yesterday during the discussion about religion, but I won't go there. It's just a theory. <laughs> okay. Um, later in this, uh, more recently, Freud came along with a more scientific explanation, and he said that people are gay because they have a bad family. Uh, either the dad was too inattentive, or the mommy was too attentive, or something about family dynamics. Uh, later, with Skinnerism and behaviorism, we had the idea of social learning, that people learn it from bad role models, like Martina Navratilova, for example, or that gym guy. Uh, there's also the theory that it really is a choice, that it's something that people think over and then make a bad decision. And then, at least in academic circles, there's the idea of social constructionism, that it comes from a bad environment. Although I have to say that if anyone saw this guy, they would probably decide not to be gay. It's almost an advertisement for heterosexuality. But as natural scientists began thinking about this issue, um, we realized that part of the problem is that we're really asking the wrong question. The wrong question is not what makes people gay. The right question is what makes people straight? Why are people heterosexual. And of course, as soon as you ask anyone this question, they'll immediately say, well, it's nature. It is natural to be heterosexual. It must be something biological. And we say this because we all recognize that there has to be a strong biological program for people to be straight because that's how we pass on our genes to the next generation. So if there weren't a strong genetic or evolutionary force that made people heterosexual, those people wouldn't mate, they wouldn't pass on their genes, they would die out. And so there must be some sort of really strong genetic program for coding for people's desire, usually for members of the opposite sex. Well, what are those biological factors? Uh, first of all, they must be genes, since that's the master molecule. We know in terms of sexuality that hormones are also important because hormones, after all, are what really differentiate us into either males or females. And of course, those hormones and the genes then act on specific structures in the brain. And you heard a little bit about those when we talked about sex differences the other day. Okay, so if that's what makes people straight, then what makes people gay? Well, the most likely explanation is that it is exactly the same factors slightly altered. Why do we think that? Because whenever you have DNA, you have variation. Uh, we all have pretty much the same genes, but about 0.1% of our DNA is different. And since those variations are inevitable, 
uh, it's reasonable to suppose that variations in the sex orientation genes also cause differences. So that's the idea that's been, been pursued by a lot of natural scientists like myself. And I'm going to focus on the gene aspect because I'm a geneticist and that's what I understand the best. Well, to study sexual orientation, we have to have a way to measure it. We can't just say gay or straight. We have a very nice yardstick that was developed by uh, Alfred Kinsey many years ago. It's called the Kinsey scale, and it goes from zero for completely straight to six for completely gay. And there's different aspects of sexuality, your attraction, who you fantasize about, who you actually have sex with, and in modern times, how you self-identify. They're all pretty strongly correlated, although certainly not perfectly. Um, in the studies I'll describe where we're looking at people who are openly gay, uh, there's not really much of an issue about how to make that measurement. Now, what's interesting is how sexual orientation is distributed in the population, and in particular to compare males and females, because there's quite a difference. If you look at males, most males either are almost completely heterosexual, or they're almost completely gay, with very few in between. And some of you may be looking at this graph and say, wow, there's a lot of homosexuals in the United States, almost 50%. Um, of course, that's not the population distribution. It's a study population. In the real population, it's somewhere around 5% or so. When you look at females, a very different pattern emerges. There are some women who are completely straight or who are completely lesbian, but there are also a lot in the middle, a lot of people who are uh, in part uh, attracted to one sex and in part to the other. And there's also a lot of flexibility over time. One of my favorite experiences as a researcher was interviewing a woman who was 82 years old. She was the mother of a gay guy in our study, and I gave her the complete sexual workup. She was heterosexual, married twice, really liked guys, no interest in women, had never slept with a woman. But as she left the interview, she said, well, there's one question you didn't ask me. You didn't ask about my next partner. And then she said, you know, at 82, the men are just ridiculously bad. I mean, there's no choice. So I assume my next partner will be a woman. And that was the end of that. A very big difference with males. We don't understand the basis for that difference. Uh, there may be biological reasons, as David Buss just described. There may be strong cultural reasons. It may simply be that women are more honest than men are. But at any rate, uh, it certainly is something that's easier to tell in males than it is in females. Right, so what accounts for that variability in the population? That's the question we're interested in. And the classic way of looking at that for geneticists is to compare twins and adoptees. And when you do that, what you find is that about 50% of the differences in sexual orientation are because of people's genes, their inherited factors. By contrast, the environment, meaning the specific or shared environment, having the same parents or going to the same school is relatively unimportant. In fact, it has no apparent effect in males and only a minor effect in women. And the rest of the variance, we simply don't understand. We don't know how much of it is biological, how much of it is random or stochastic, but the main quantifiable factor is in fact our genes, although it's certainly not exclusive. But simply saying that there are genes is not enough. We need to know what the genes are, because that's the only way we can figure out what's actually going on in the brain, is to get at the actual molecules that are involved. And this may be very complicated, because there's going to be a lot of genes, there's going to be a lot of chemicals in the brains, a lot of things going on. But we need to start by isolating the genes. And that's something that we started um, almost 15 years ago now, by doing first family histories, and then by actually looking at people's DNA. And what we found when we looked at the pedigrees of gay men, in the chart on the left, is that they had a fair number of gay relatives, more than you'd expect by chance. And they all tended to be on the mother's side of the family. So a gay guy would have a gay uncle on the mother's side, or a gay great uncle, or one family you might see there where there's several gay people over the generations in a family where the great-great-grandfather married two women who were sisters to one another, um, not at the same time, but at different times, and that subsequently was passed down. So to a geneticist, that's really interesting because the simplest explanation of that is that there's a gene on the X chromosome because the X chromosome only goes from mothers to sons. 
sons uh, get their other sex chromosome from their father's, the Y chromosome. So anything that's on the X will be passed down the mom's side of the family. And in fact, there's a molecular way to test that, and that is to actually look at the X chromosome DNA of gay men and compare it to related gay men, in this case, to gay brothers. And when we did that study, we found that over most of the X chromosome, there was nothing mapping, nothing happening. But at one particular location that's called XQ28, there was that little bump of positivity. And when that was studied in detail, it turns out that in that one region, that one small region of this one chromosome, there is a gene or genes that are somehow influencing sexual orientation. And we know that because not only did the gay brothers share that region, but in addition, the heterosexual brothers tended not to have that. So it's like there's a gene. There's two versions of that gene. One says probably gay, and the other says probably straight. And depending on which version of that gene you happen to inherit from your mother, if you're a guy, that'll influence whether or not you're gay or straight. Subsequently, that study was replicated in several samples, three other samples, not in another sample that was uh, done in Canada. And if you add together all the results, it looks like there is at least one locus at this location that's important. Now, I want to emphasize that's not the gay gene. There are actually at least 50 other genes that are involved, and three of those we've already located. And they're not on the X chromosome, they're on all of the other chromosomes, and there are a number of links that have been located. So this is not the definitive finding of the gay gene. It's just the first hint that there's something in a molecular level that people eventually will be able to trace down. One of the questions people often ask is, well, if there's a gay gene, how could it evolve? Gay people don't have kids. How could it be passed down? It turns out there's a simple answer to that called sexual antagonism, where a gene that does one thing in males has an opposite effect in females. So if you think about a gene that makes men sexually attractive, if you're a guy and you get that gene, you're going to be gay. Maybe you won't have so many kids. But imagine a woman that gets the gay gene. She'll really like guys. I mean, not just for their money, David, but she'll like them sexually, and voila, you're probably going to have more children. Now, that might seem like just another storytelling thing, like so much of this type of uh, evolution. But in fact, there's now very strong empirical data that supports that. A number of studies in England and in Italy showing that if you look at the families of gay men, that the mothers or the women on the maternal side, in fact, have increased fecundity compared to the population at large and compared to all of the other female relatives in exactly the same families. So this suggests that there's a rather simple sexual selection going on that will keep this gene in the population at some reasonable equilibrium level. Now, you might be thinking, well, you know, this is, you don't actually have the genes. Is this really right? Let me give you a quick example of a case where we actually have the gene and we know what the chemical is. It's a gene that makes people lusty or libidinous or horny. I'm not sure how you translate it in uh, Spanish, but I'm sure you know what I mean. And it turns out to be a gene you've already heard about the other day, and that is the serotonin transporter. This is a gene that uh, transports and controls the level of serotonin. It's well known because it's the target for drugs like Prozac. And as you heard uh, just the other day, the main effect of this gene is to affect people's depression and anxiety levels. But if you've ever taken Prozac, you know there's a side effect, which is that it also decreases libido. It's a reason that a lot of people don't like those drugs. It turns out the gene has the same effect. And then if you separate people into those that have the long allele or the short allele, there's a striking difference in how often they have sex. If you have the long allele, for example, you are more likely to be having sex uh, less than once a week and the opposite for the short allele. And so some of you may now be you know, going back to your notes and trying to figure out, oh, long, short. It's very simple. It works the same as the drug. If you meet a person who's happy, very nice, everything is good, that's fine, but you're probably not going to have sex that often. You want the anxious, worried, nervous one. They're the ones who are going to be having sex all the time. So um, I'm not sure if this is an example of what you think is not always correct or an example of a silver lining to every cloud. Uh, but anyway, it does explain why a gene that makes people unhappy is still in the population. All right, so now the question is, so what? So what if it's genetic? 
what difference does that make if you're not a geneticist or a biologist? Well, this is one area where scientific knowledge actually has a big effect. And we know that as an empirical fact because we have good data. If you ask people in the United States, do you think that being gay is a choice? Or do you think that people are born that way? In other words, is it genetic? Uh, you get about a 50-50 response. Half of people think that it's some sort of arbitrary choice. Half of people think that it's biological. What's interesting is that if you then ask these same people their attitude about gay rights, they have very different answers. So for example, if you ask people, do you think there should be gay marriage, people th that think that being gay is a choice say, no, there should not be. Whereas people that think that it's genetic are more likely to say, yeah, that would be OK. What's really interesting is that if you ask people, should gay relations be illegal? Should people that are gay be put in jail or fined? Then you get a response that those who think that it is a choice overwhelmingly believe that being gay should be illegal and that there should be a reinstitution of sodomy laws. Uh, whereas those who believe that people are born gay are much less likely to say that. So uh, for me as a geneticist who also happens to be gay, this is a really good incentive to make sure that this research is done very well and publicized because otherwise I would end up in jail. Interestingly, I might end up in jail in the United States, but here in Mexico where there's constitutional protection for sexual orientation, that wouldn't be the case. That looks really bad, whatever that is. So, uh, huh, something happened to the slides, but I think I can conclude uh, with, with two thoughts. The first is that I do not want to leave you with the idea that genetics should be used as a basis for human rights, because that is that naturalist fallacy, which is so very false. If we thought that anything that was natural was good, well, what would happen if we discovered that being a rapist has a genetic basis. And it almost certainly will, as it turns out. Um, that doesn't mean that being a rapist is OK. Being a rapist is bad because it hurts somebody else. It hurts somebody else's uh, personal rights. Um, I think that if we think about the morality or the ethics of sexual orientation, we already have a universally accepted set of principles that everybody can agree on. And those are the principles we heard talked about yesterday from both sides of the debate. The basic principle that every human being has a fundamental right to life, to liberty, to equal justice under the law, and to the pursuit of happiness, as long as they don't interfere with anybody else's rights. And if you look at sexual orientation from that point of view, it's pretty simple because obviously having sex with the person of your choice, having a loving relationship with the person who you desire to is a very important part of the pursuit of happiness. And it doesn't do anything wrong to anybody else. It's just consulting adults doing what they want. Um, so I think that people that are Muslim, people that are Catholic, people that are Protestant, people that are atheists, people that are agnostic, that everybody can agree uh, on that fundamental principle. Sometimes the theology gets a little bit complicated and people misinterpret things to think that it's bad to be gay, but that'll get straightened out with time, one hopes. Uh, the second point that I want to make is that this is an instance where genetic arguments do have a profound effect because they influence public understanding. And that ultimately is what influences the laws that we have and the culture that we have and the society that we have. And that makes a tremendous difference. So this is one uh, th place where I think that we can really say bravo for science. Um, it's not just good for gay and lesbian people. Uh, it's good for everybody, because I think that all of us want to live in a more equitable society. Thank you.